And first, thank you to our host, Hannah Wilkun, member of the European Parliament, a member of ITRE, Tran and AIDA, rapporteur on the DSA in the ITRE committee, co-chair of, of the SME circle in the European Parliament, co-chair of SME Connect platform economy working group. And like always, we're starting with a welcome and an opening, then with a European keynotes and then a regional debate. And then I will introduce during this webinar, the single speakers we have here. I'm very happy that we have really from nearly every country in the north, some representative. And please, Hannah, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much. And good morning, everybody. I think this is very important topic, uh, what we are speaking about, and also very timely discussion, because we are just, uh, during these weeks, we are trying to conclude our negotiations in the parliament about the Digital Service Act. And uh, as you know about the background, I'm, I'm sure uh, it's almost one year ago in December 2020, then the Commission published two legislative proposals aimed at making uh, digital environments more safe and fair for consumers and businesses. And one of the proposed regulations concerns digital services, DSA, that we are speaking today. And there was also in the same package, the uh, Digital Market Act, DMA. Uh, DSA aims to improve uh, the functioning of the digital single market and in particular the services offered by so-called intermediaries. These include, for example, cloud services, online platforms and content sharing networks. New rules are needed because a uh, lot has changed since the e-commerce directive was adopted in 2000. In the past 20 years, we know that the intermediaries uh, such as online platforms, have created many new opportunities for consumers and also for businesses. At the same time, they have also enabled the dissemination of illegal content and uh, sale of illegal goods and services online. So I think uh, the main goal of the new DSA, it's, it's a very good one because it's, it's to create more safe and uh, uh, accountable digital environment. And... Uh, main principle also, I think it's very good that we have to make sure that what is e illegal offline should be also illegal online. So same rules in online and offline world. And uh, to reach this goal, it's sure that we need, for example, measures to counter illegal content such as illegal uh, content flagging mechanism. And also we have to look at how the business users, they can identify sellers of illegal goods. And we also need more transparency measures for platforms concerning, uh, for example, their recommendation algorithms. And we need also safeguards for users, for example, ways to challenge uh, content moderation de uh, decisions. And uh, of course, there's very different players in the online world. And I think uh, very much uh, uh, the discussion has been focused to very large online platforms. And, uh, I think that they also need new obligations uh, to prevent abusive market behavior because they have very big role and they, have, they are very dominant players. And uh, it's important that we are trying to create a level playing field and fair competition to our digital markets. So, and also this, of course, um, means that uh, when we speak about level playing field, also the companies which are based in the third countries but operating in the internal market follow the same rules as European companies. So we are really trying to create that kind of uh, atmosphere to Europe that uh, uh, all the players here who are working or who are offering services in an online world or uh, servicing content there, uh, they should respect European values, our regulation and legislation also uh, in internet world in, in Europe. But uh, as you know, the task of legislating digital environment, it's not very easy. And uh, I think one of the main concerns uh, should be all the time that uh, um, we shouldn't overregulate our markets. And I think it's always the risk when we speak about digital legislation in Europe that often we will have too heavy regulation. And especially, of course, we have to look at uh, the role of SMEs, because we have to also look at what kind of risks those uh, services are like posing, and we should have the right balance there, that we are setting not, not, that we are not setting too much obligations uh, for very small players, for micro enterprises and small enterprises, because um, in the same time, when we need uh, uh, legal certainty, level playing field, fair competition, we have to, 
boost innovations in Europe and we have to encourage investments in Europe. And that means that we, we can't set new barriers for, for more businesses. And this has been one of the main discussions now in the parliament, in the committees, that what kind of exemptions we should have for micro and small enterprises and uh, what are really the actions we, we should take with, uh, with the, also with the smallest players and how we could avoid uh, red tape for the small, smallest players in, in this market. And of course, this will be our focus uh, today in this discussion that uh, we will hear, I'm sure, examples from the small businesses and from the startups that how they see that what kind of rules we need and where we have to look very carefully that we are not over-regulating to markets. Um, now the legislative process in the European Parliament re really it's on the stage that we are discussing about the uh, uh, compromises in IMCO committee. IMCO committee is the leading committee, so it's a uh, 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 market of inter it's a committee of internal market and consumer protection it's the main committee and i was rapporteur of itri committee industry committee and i'm taking a part of those negotiations with imco now and uh, uh, as ITRI rapporteur, my focus as a rapporteur was, has been very much on those uh, small and micro enterprises such as startups which which play a key role in creating Europe's digital competitiveness and growth. And uh, now I, I could maybe pick up a few discussions we have had there until, and after that we will go to your, your presentation. We have been very much uh, discussing about the online advertising during the last weeks because there's also um, pressure uh, in some political groups that they would like to like ban uh, targeted advertising and uh, I think it's very important that uh, uh, in the new DSA that we we ensure that all the users that they are well informed uh, whether and why they are targeted by each ad and who, who paid to ad. But I'm not uh, willing to put any bans for targeted advertising or not that kind of like opt-in uh, ideas that you have to that you are not getting targeted advertising, um, uh, or you, you could maybe opt out of that, but not like opt in option. It's it's not possible, I think. But this has been very difficult discussion in, in the parliament during the last weeks. And I think this is very important for our small, small businesses that they have to have the possibility to reach their customers in online world. So we can't have that kind of legislation that you can't use targeted advertising. And also another discussion we have had about the recommender system. And I think uh, it's also a very important part of internet services that we have recommender system, but some of the political groups that they are also very willing to ban recommender system and uh, or uh, asking or they are asking that all the online services should have that kind of possibility for the user that they can choose that they they are not willing to have recommender system but i think it's not possible if we think about small businesses because often the whole business idea whole service is like recommender system and you, if you should have choice that you should have like two different services, one with recommender system and one without, it's not possible. Maybe for VLOPs, it's possible for very large online platforms, but not for the small players. So these are the examples of the discussions we are having right now about online advertising and about recommender system. And I'm sure that everybody would like to have more transparency, of course there, but then we have to also look at which are like business secrets and which are really, you know, business ideas that uh, should be possible also in the future. And we shouldn't ban that kind of uh, things are which, which are really core of the internet world. So these are just uh, two examples we are discussing. And I'm sure that you have several several examples now when we are going to your, your speeches and you can tell about your experience and views about digital service uh, markets and what should be done and what shouldn't be done now when we are finalizing our um, our view of this regulation and after that when we in the parliament when we have voted um, the regulation then we will uh, continue the negotiations with the member states in the council and I'm, I'm sure that during the France pre presidency now during the next month in the spring we are trying to finalize also the regulation with with the council and with the member states so these are very important weeks and I'm very willing to take feedback and ideas from your side. 
thank you very much. I think you gave us a perfect overview uh, at consumer protection, fair market, uh, to have an environment for innovation. And I think very much important is to have also not to forget SMEs. I have to say, if I'm reading the newspapers and, and the articles about uh, this in the, in the member states, it's only about the big tech companies and the SADMA, nobody in the public uh, discussing what is the impact for SMEs. They're totally forgotten. And I think it's only discussed in Brussels. So we have really, I uh, thank you very much that you have this, this focus on it. I think we need strong, strong voices. And now we're starting with the first uh, round and the European perspective or European keynotes. We are starting with Frederick Eriksson, Director of European Center for International Political, Political Economy. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Horst, and thank you also for the opportunity to follow um, right on from Hannah and, and her excellent perspective, like laying out sort of the um, ambitions, thinking, and some of the problems um, that may arise as a consequence of uh, Europe perhaps being a little bit too keen on regulating um, a lot of things when it comes to the digital sphere. I think we have to start the discussion sort of in a broader context of understanding where Europe may have problems when it comes to digitalizing its economy more broadly, and in, in particular to make sure that smaller organizations, especially SMEs, but it's not just SMEs, but that smaller organizations will have easy access to modern technology about either reaching customers um, or uh, modern technology that can help to improve the operational efficiency of the entire operations they have. This is the problem we have. I mean, we have gone through lots of studies from various types of countries to try to understand where Europe is lagging behind many other advanced economies in the world when it comes to digital intensities and digital penetration. And what you, what you quite often find is that um, the, the gap between Europe and where the frontier of the world is when it comes to um, pushing digital technologies isn't so much on the consumer side. It's not that we have uh, less digital human capital in Europe compared with, for instance, with the United States or where advanced economies in Asia. The gap is quite often on the producer side or on the company side. That's where Europe is behind the frontier. And, and the way we need to think about it, in my view, is sort of what can we do to help European companies to come closer to the global frontier on, on digitalization and pushing new technologies? Because that is going to increase productivity. It's going to increase um, market creation for all types of organizations, regardless of their size. Um, regulation plays a very, very important part here, um, because uh, when you compare, for instance, countries within Europe and you look at the degree of variation in their regulatory structure that applies or that informs the overall perspective for the digital market, you will find very easily that countries that are more open have faster digitalization, they have more equitable digitalization in the sense that there are more types of economies and sorry, more types of companies that participate uh, and make a good business out of digitalization. And that can be everything from, as I said, reaching customers, creating new markets, but it can also be how you improve uh, the way your organizations work, um, storing cloud or having access to other customer relations uh, tools that, that uh, uh, modern technology can provide you with. Uh, here, it's perfectly obvious that most of the Nordic countries are very uh, well ahead of the rest of Europe. Um, and one of the key reasons for it is that it's far more easier to do digital businesses in digital business in the Nordic economies compared to, for instance, Germany, France, Spain, Italy, Belgium, Austria. Um, so regulation plays an important role here. My second point would be a little bit more specific to the DSA and how we should think about the SME connection uh, to the DSA. 
There is a conversation going on, partly because it's reflected in the construction of the DSA, uh, how the Commission conceived it initially, which is that you um, may uh, exempt certain type of companies from the rules that are going to apply in the DSA. That may be important itself, but I don't think the major perspective we should have here is what type of small platform firms do we have right now that can grow and eventually start to compete with the larger platforms that exist right now and that provide this digital intermediation um, uh, between uh, producer and consumer. I hope there's going to be lots of exciting entrepreneurial activity which is going to enable uh, more European companies to grow uh, and become very large platforms as well. But for the time being, I don't think that's, that's sort of the perspective we should have. The perspective we should have is basically to what extent will the DSA improve or make it more problematic for SMEs to use existing platforms in order to sell more and to improve their own operational efficiency. And I think here, sort of as a rule of thumb, one of the problems we have with the DSA is that it's intentionally trying to make life a lot more difficult for the launch platforms. Uh, not necessarily because there is um, a social or economic objective behind it. Uh, for some parts of the DSA, that's clear. These objectives exist, but for some, there isn't. And, um, and for some of the, for, for these areas, we can also see that there is a, there's a lot of regulatory overlap here, that we are trying to put a new layer of regulation on something which we're already regulating. So if you look, for instance, at illegal content or illegal goods uh, that are being uh, offered on, on platforms, there are already laws against it. There are already regulations against it. There are already a lot of pressure uh, from regulators, not just on platforms, but on many others that they need to uh, have uh, a much stronger vetting of what is happening there and that they need to take down um, um, uh, content that is illegal um, as soon as they receive information about it. Um, so it's the, the, the situation right now is not that you know, things are legal online that are legal offline. There is already parity here. But what the DSA is trying to do is basically to sharpen the definition of illeg illegality online for some, but not for others. And certainly not for those that are sort of not in the bracket uh, uh, of, of uh, very large platforms. So here I think there is something that we need to spend a lot more time thinking about so when we add, for instance, uh, traceability systems on transactions that happens on, uh, on platforms, I think for most big platforms, this wouldn't be a problem as long as they can use existing mechanisms uh, in order to do that. Um, here, the devil is going to be in the detail exactly what type of traceability system they will need to have. For instance, can they rely on uh, a payment provider uh, to basically be the uh, the, the vehicle for traceability uh, for transactions that happens on the platform. My last point is going to be, um, which is my fear uh, with the DSA. So the DSA, as well as many other regulations that we've seen in the past when it comes to very large platforms, it's basically you add um, the risk of a very, very big penalty uh, on these platforms. So um, you provide a couple of instructive rules for how they should behave. Um, now you include sort of a vague, ambiguous definition of systemic risk monitoring. And then you sort of you come again with the risk of uh, having a very, very large fine being um, put on the companies. Um, uh, that um, will not sort of fully comply with the letter and intent of, of the DSA. Now, all these companies, of course, they could pay it. I mean, these are resourceful companies. But what have we learned in the past for what these platforms do when they are exposed to that type of penalty risks? Well, it is that they're going to start to raise the thresholds for 
either users, producers, or others to use the platforms. So um, what they are more likely going to do is to deny access to many of uh, uh, the small micro companies that exist right now, where they are unsure about uh, what type of content that goes in and where it's just not affordable. It's not economically reasonable uh, to spend the time and resources to figure that out before you provide access to the platform. So the risk here is that we're going to find what sort of see a reinforcement of our platform already do and have done in the past with, when they are, are confronted with, with uh, huge penalty risks, they try to reduce risk and reduce risk they basically do by, uh, by uh, uh, denying access, taking down things that are perfectly legal uh, and introduces sort of more costs and more problems of, of accessing modern technology for those who aren't big enough uh, with the resources so they can demonstrate the, uh, the, the sort of legality of, of, um, of the production. This is my fear. And I think this has to be reflected much more in the conversation that we have about DSA because we know now from 15 years of regulating big platforms, how they behave in response to platforms. And, and this is not good. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this very interesting presentation. I think we need regulation, we need smart regulation. This is, I think, the difference. I think it's also important to say it's the ecosystems. If you, but this is in every business sector, it's not only for digital. If you try to, to, to focus only on the big ones, you will also, of course, they try to transfer the costs to the small ones, um, because this is in every business like this, and in the end, the consumer is paying this. This is this is also clear. I think uh, what is also very important that we have not to forget we are in global competition, and I think in the end, also that that we have different uh, societies and speed on digitalization. I think North Europe is a very going faster to a digital society than other parts. If you're coming to cashless money, you see what ideologic discussions we have in Germany or how far forward is this in Sweden already. Where you, I think this makes also a little bit uh, the difference why the perspectives are often a little bit different. And I think now we're coming to Sebastian Felix Schwemmer, Associate Professor, Center for Information and Innovation Law, University of Copenhagen, advisor to the European Commission to, in relation to the Digital Service Act. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and thanks for these very interesting um, interventions already. So what I'm coming with is a rather academic perspective. Uh, the background is my research is mainly in automated content moderation, recommender systems and some nerdy infrastructure things. Um, the DSA background study that I was main author of also interested uh, looking at I think my connection is you were twice up. frozen twice so you have oh, to repeat the, the i thing. will repeat um yes. i'm so sorry i hope the connection will be will be better now uh, so uh, as a main author of one of the background studies services act um and uh, i posted it in the chat uh, it's uh, on some of the more technical aspects of content living networks, DNS uh, and cloud computing. I'm also involved in Horizon 2020 project where we look at intermediaries and their algorithmic content moderation, um, uh, which is of interest. And lastly, in uh, Scandinavia, I was uh, part and co-initiator of the Copenhagen for the Wind Foundation and Tech Festival Copenhagen. So I've been working with a lot of startups and SMEs previously. Um, and I have three messages regarding this discussion. So first of all, and this is, I guess, restating what some of the previous interventions already mentioned is, well, the DSA and internet regulation at large is not only relevant for very large online platforms, but it's important to not throw everything in one bowl. And not only that, it's also important to be aware of spillover effects intended or unintended. The second point will be horizontal principles. Now, the e-commerce directive worked surprisingly well for 21 years. 21 years ago, the internet looked very, very different. Um, it's important that there's a revision, but keep it simple and, uh, and future-proof. Maybe not everything um, 
current issues in the internet ecosystem should and need to be regulated in this instrument. And lastly, especially also looking at SMEs and startups, legal certainty. So when we look at the Digital Services Act, there's two big parts, the liability exemption regime, which basically remains unchanged with a little uh, ex exception, and that's the, uh, that's the uh, Article 6 uh, proposal on the voluntary own initiative investigation. So basically inspired by US American law, but very different, a good Samaritan clause saying, well, the intermediary service providers, if you want to do more, you don't lose your liability exemption. And that sounds fantastic as a starting point. But, um, and actually the Schaldemus report uh, points that out as well, there needs to be some safeguards because um, otherwise um, one of the big concerns is the private regulation of the internet and the private regulation by intermediaries of information access of what is not only illegal, but also unwanted. So the lawful but awful content, how is that being dealt with? So I think this is a very interesting question um, for, for the liability exemptions in as far this actually really is such a good idea for all intermediaries. Looking for SMEs more concrete, uh, the due diligence obligations are the most interesting part. I think um, there's the terms and conditions that I'm going to touch a little more about because I think that's very interesting. Uh, if you're in the hosting uh, space, uh, there's a notice and action mechanism and statement of reason uh, provision. Uh, micro and small enterprises would be exempt right now, at least in the commission's proposal from the complaint handling procedure, the out of court dispute uh, settlement, there's no trusted flagger obligation. But importantly, there wouldn't also be an obligation for measures and protection against misuse. And I wonder, well, in detail, is this really the right um, uh, categorization of these obligations? Because these obligations might actually be relevant irrespective of the size of the actor, um, especially in those instances when one of these intermediaries voluntarily behaves like a very large online platform in terms of how they, for example, offer a um, redress mechanism. Shouldn't that then be a level playing field among those? Um, I also think the recommender system discussion is quite interesting. Recommender systems, uh, there's a provision for very large online platforms that basically addresses um, an opt-out and uh, to transparency perspective. Uh, again, maybe this is something that is relevant beyond the very large online platforms also because think about the Digital Services Act maybe already next year being finalized under the French presidency. Um, how will the internet look like in 10 years, in 15 years? Will it still be the very large online platforms or is these is what we're really looking at more some patterns that are emerging across the uh, the different intermediaries. I promise to touch a little more about uh, on the terms and conditions, because I think that's a very interesting one, especially also for SMEs. If you look at Article 12, the proposal by the Commission, it basically says, similarly to the GDPR, in a very nice language, easily understandable, Schaldemose comes with a fantastic idea of maybe that should even be graphically visualized, maybe we can get away from what we do, uh, writing law and interpreting legal texts, and it's very difficult to read, so maybe visualizing this, but basically an obligation to, for all intermediaries, um, be very clear about the restrictions they impose on the content uploaded. And not only that, the, that would be the policies, it would also be whether they use algorithmic content moderation tools. And then in paragraph two, there's something really interesting. Uh, because there it says, well, this is also something where the intermediary service providers would need to act in an objective, diligent, and proportionate manner when applying these restrictions. And they need to look at the fundamental rights, the opposing fundamental rights, freedom of expression by the users, for example, on the one hand. Um, the infringed rights by rights holders on the others. So it seems there is an idea of that fundamental rights through the back door maybe come into an almost impact assessment that all intermediaries might need to do, which I think actually is a fantastic vehicle, but it's very unclear for me right now how that would work and what that uh, would um, uh, in, entail. So um, trying to sum up my three points. This regulation is definitely relevant far beyond very large online platforms, um, but it's very important to not throw everything into one bowl and be aware of these spillover effects when regulating very large online platforms to other platforms or other intermediaries along the, the technology state, uh, technological development. Um, the DSA is uh, basically revisiting the e-commerce directive, which is a horizontal framework, all forms of illegal content, um, functional and all forms of liability. And that was quite future-proof 
it lasted for 21 years, more or less okay. Um, I would be very sad to see the DSA as a follow-up vehicle to be so complex and trying to solve so many of the very detailed right now issues that it's in fact not so relevant anymore in 10 years and might have to be visited fast, uh, much faster. And lastly, legal certainty, which I think is really important for, for startups and SMEs, um, there's the devil in the detail. What is active passive? Can there be more clarifications there? The knowledge of illegality. And what about this gray zone? The DSA is not only about illegal information, there's actually also something about unwanted information, lawful but awful. How is that being addressed and dealt and how should that be addressed and dealt? When you look back, the copyright directive um, that entered into force uh, two years ago and is currently being implemented across member states, when that was um, proposed, uh, uh, Heini Zagariasen, uh, the co-founder of Vivino, it's a Danish very famous app where you check wine labels um, to see whether the wine is good or not, he went out publicly and said, well, if this um, proposal by the commission back then in the copyright directive uh, would have been there, Vivino wouldn't exist. Now, I haven't heard these concerns with the Digital Services Act, but I think it's very important to put a little more emphasis on what this does out there, the main issues and the main center of attention, which of course is the very big online platforms. Um, that is, I think, my intervention for now, and then I look forward to the discussion uh, going forward. Thank you very much. I think this was very good to go deeper in the details. I think if I summarize this, less is more, keep it simple and practical and future-proofed. And I think uh, this, I think, was very nice to, to, to see how practical the impact is, and that is also horizontal. And now we're coming to the regional debate, and Anneliese Badinand, was asking me to start, and I do give her perspective, Director of the Deutsche Industrie- und Handelskammer office in Brussels. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Horst. So I'm a representative of the German uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Um, hello, Mrs. Verkenem. So we have felt very concerned that the DSA is becoming always uh, less SME friendly as discussions uh, advance in Parliament and Council, although the Commission proposal already contained very extensive new rules for digital services. In our opinion, there is a hyperinflation of um, obligations directed at platforms with always more rules concerning the protection of consumers, which go far beyond the initial purpose of the regulation. And I simply wonder how small companies would be able to implement such a broad piece of legislation eventually. Um, don't get me wrong, we need the DSA. Uh, many companies are terribly impacted by illegal content online, such as unsafe or counterfeited products, but they need um, more balanced rules. And I believe this is necessary to achieve the goals of the DSA while having more proportionate regulation, which will enable eventually innovation and growth in Europe. Um, concerning the liability, um, I, I, I believe that it would be very dangerous to depart from the principle of conditional exemption of liability provided for by the e-commerce directive. The idea of the IMCO rapporteur, Mrs. Schaldemose, to impose new recourse rights against online marketplaces in B2C context or when traders are not to be found would completely discourage small players from the platform business they would not be able to uh, absorb the liability rules, um, the liability costs, excuse me. And um, online marketplaces are also not often in a position where they are able to determine if a trader is offering a defective product. And also we believe that there should be no stay down obligations in the DSA according to which marketplaces can encounter heavy sanctions when illegal content taken down reappears this would equal to a general monitoring obligation, which platforms, especially the small one, are not able to provide. Um, we also believe that strict timeframes should uh, not be imposed on platforms for the removal of illegal content, because platform would otherwise give priority to a quick removal over a time-consuming careful consideration, which would eventually lead to overblocking of legal content. So as in the Commission's proposal, we strongly favor more flexible rules that we will adapt to a diversity of situations. Um, we also believe that companies are heavily burdened by several due diligence obligations in the DSA. 
the DSA creates tremendous risk that only big players would be able to implement such rules, while SMEs could end up being completely wiped off the platform economy. Exemptions for small and medium enterprises um, must therefore remain in place. We strongly disagree with the proposal of Mr. Schaldemose to remove this exemption. And we also believe that there should be no additional due diligence obligation added in the DSA compared to the Commission's proposal. On the opposite, we actually need more exemptions. Um, in this respect, I believe that we can reach um, progress with regard to uh, the notice and takedown mechanism, transparency and reporting obligations to make these rules a bit more SME friendly. And something else that maybe is not enough present in the debate, we could add more templates so that company, when the DSA is applicable, immediately know how to implement the most complex rules. Um, regarding the, bad on, the ban on targeted advertising, which is being discussed in the parliament at the moment, as we all said, um, this is not realistic. Many small companies rely on targeted advertising uh, to reach consumers. And um, on another uh, perspective, the GSA is here again being used for purposes that it was not designed for. The DSA should provide for rules and procedure to fight against illegal content, but it is not an adequate legislation for the definition of what is illegal. We have to keep a bit of legal clarity. And um, my last point concerned the trusted flaggers. Um, the provisions objectives are not clear and they should be sh thoroughly revised with a view to solely fight against blatant illegality. We should make sure that any possibility of political influence is being avoided. And given the political stand of a consumer organi organization, their role should be clarified. So these rules uh, for trusted flagger must be workable in practice. And um, the acquisition of the stages of trusted flagger should also be limited to a very small amount of actors. My Bottom line um, is that we need to have um, we need to have a reason approach uh, with the DSA. I fully agree with Sebastian. We cannot pack everything in this piece of legislation. There is already a lot in the Commission's proposal, and we need to keep in mind that eventually companies will have to implement these rules, so they have to be workable and provide enough legal certainty. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anneliese, for for this very strong message. I think. You, you give the concern really also the right, the right uh, voice. And I hope you will be also heard in Berlin, not only in Brussels, that really, uh, I think there is a danger for, for, for small, medium entrepreneurs if this is really enforced like this, like it's planned now. I think, I hope it's come better out than, than we, are, we are fearing. So now we're coming to Juni Lunasma, CEO Startup Foundation Finland. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks a lot. If you allow, I would I would really want to show you three slides to illustrate a, a perspective on things that I, I have. So just a minute. Um, now and then uh, I believe you should be seeing something right now. Yes, it's there. Okay, good. Uh, so just to just to give a big bit of background. Uh, Startup Foundation is, is based in Finland, Helsinki. We are a non-profit organization established by 57 entrepreneurs to support the growth of the ecosystem. Uh, we are the mother company of Slush, which I'm glad will be will be happening this year. And also we are there's a number of activists. We are shareholder in a large startup campus based in Helsinki. So my my uh, kind of a uh, point of view here is really the, the kind of a creation of new companies and new teams and I'm, I'm concerned that the uh, DSA though it's it's important as a subject may have uh, harmful uh, side effects on that and therefore I would I would hope that in, even in the future playing is encouraged and not not forbidden I, I think this this uh, panel is really timely just last week there was there was news from the most recent Finnish unicorn called Ivan. Uh, it's it's working in with cloud infrastructure. And it it was now now valued close to to two billion uh, euros as well. Um, this is this is kind of a um, 
an illustration of the of the dynamics which is important here um, in order to have the unicorns and scale ups what, what we need is like a constant flow of new ideas um, and, and a startup by definition is something where you don't know if it's if it's viable as a business uh, the model is not validated uh, there's high ambition for growth and then there's two ways what, what can happen e either Either you succeed and the company grows and, and we get good, uh, great companies with a lot of jobs and, and tax revenue and, and all the good side, or then it's possible that it turns out to be like a normal SME or then you cease operations. But, but what is important here is that there's always new ideas that come to play. And with new ideas, um, we don't know what they are. And this, this uh, brings me to my, my um, kind of a point, which is that that for new, new ideas to emerge, there needs to be a certain amount of experimentation and play. And of course, this is a, this is a picture of sandbox. I like to relate to that, that even, even for the companies, we need to have a way for, for guys to, uh, and girls and whoever starts companies to experiment with new ideas, try out, try them on the market as, as well. This comes back to the user acquisition point that was touch here several times that that um, the new companies the new platforms they 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 also need users somehow you need to get to them so uh, I, I would want to see that in in the European innovation ecosystems this is this is a central central piece that, that playing is around allowed then I, I had a look at, at because I think in, in sometimes uh, startups and and SMEs are considered they, they are like furry nice puppies in a way but but if if we are looking at puppies what what's common with them is that it's easy to train them when they are young and and I think this is this is something we need to uh, look at here as well so truly new ideas cannot be recognized before the the regulation needs to be future proof as was mentioned here before but also, um, like once you scale your company, it's easy. While the way you go, if if the legislation is clear, what is required, you can learn, you can build in those those necessary necessary tools, necessary uh, um, things that you need to do uh, in order to th then scale. If you are to succeed, and and I, I I'd like last point is to emphasize that I think there should be an element of risk analysis not everything is equal I mean if you're a large platform it's impacting a lot of people but but it needs to be in proportion to what's what's uh, the size size of the business and size of the company and so that during the time when you you scale you will be able to adapt the adapt the uh, regulations that are, are necessary there so this is this is my my uh, point of view that there needs to be room for experimentation and and we need to be flexible in the in the um, regulation so that not to kill innovation just to be sure that no harm is done thank you very much thank you very much uh, i think this is also important that we don't lose the startup community in europe and then they are in north america asia or in israel and uh, now we're coming to Peter Koffler, Chairman of the Danish Entrepreneurs. Please, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, having me. Um, and uh, thanks, uh, uh, Hena, for uh, listening to uh, the voices of SMEs and startup. I think it's very much needed. Uh, and I think it's uh, by time. Uh, Sebastian, I would like to say to you, I recently talked to Heine from Vivino and a lot of uh, others uh, of our members, Heine running the Vivino uh, uh, wine community, biggest in the world, um, and uh, startups are very worried on uh, what is uh, going on now with the uh, DSA. And uh, uh, Shelda Mose is obviously very busy. We are trying also with uh, uh, some of the leading startups we have in Northern Europe uh, to start the dialogue. And that's why I'm super flattered that, uh, Hina, that you uh, take your uh, time to uh, to listen to us. 
Um, so basically, my perspective, I obviously uh, represent more than 30,000 uh, members uh, in, uh, in Denmark as the chairman, but I'm also an entrepreneur myself. Uh, I've uh, tried to lay sleepless at night trying to figure out whether I comply with the uh, uh, GDPR or uh, e-privacy or um, copyright or whatever uh, we have, fearing um, if we uh, have implemented it, paying big bills to lawyers um, and uh, uh, laying sleepless whether um, uh, I will get a fine from uh, uh, the authorities. Um, so that's uh, my perspective. I will try to uh, to look at it. If I go a little bit off the helicopter, I think we really need to acknowledge that Europe is in a catching up game uh, globally. We need to do everything we can to empower startups. And we do that. And we do see initiatives from uh, Europe, uh, whether it's scale up Europe, startup nation standards, what have you. Uh, but on the other hand, and you can't keep those two things separated, we see a lot of uh, legislation coming out, we can't absorb all of it, and what we see is that we end up uh, uh, ring fencing the big players that can afford uh, big uh, setups, uh, compliance uh, setups, uh, which is uh, uh, more or less impossible uh, uh, for us to do so. So. Uh, we need to, uh, if not to lose further um, in uh, the global uh, race uh, where we see, you know, pick any defining uh, technology, uh, self-driving cars, AI, semiconductors is the most uh, recent uh, platforms uh, for that matter. Um, we're behind, we've lost uh, uh, our strongest ecosystem uh, uh, to Brexit, and still we say that, hey, startups are the most important thing to drive the visions of uh, digital Europe and uh, combat climate change uh, and uh, uh, what have you. And then I think it's super important, as many other speakers here, uh, to focus on Northern Europe, because uh, as said before, we are the early adopt adopters. We have uh, digital penetration and we have the ability to compete uh, uh, globally. Um, and I unfortunately see uh, a development where uh, some of the more, let's say, uh, reactive um, countries that's not uh, participating and competing um, are trying uh, to pull uh, Europe in uh, the wrong uh, direction. Um, we have recently, with our peers in Europe, created what we call the Frontrunners Alliance. Um, this is an alliance uh, of the D9 plus countries, but startup organizations where we try to support and uh, develop a positive uh, vision uh, around uh, tech um, and innovation, which is uh, uh, very much uh, needed um, and support the forward uh, thinking uh, digital uh, uh, countries. Um, if I go more concretely, uh, uh, into the DSA, I see a lot of thorns and I see that, uh, as was said uh, before, some of uh, these conditions will make it uh, more or less impossible for us uh, to step into uh, uh, the arena. And let me remind you that our chance is still to keep a strong European single market with 450 million uh, strong uh, consumers uh, that we can empower, but could also empower new startups, new ideas uh, to a global scale. Um, uh, my biggest worry is the targeted ads. Um, it is uh, it, how you start a business is to validate your product and you don't have endless amount of cash and you can obviously not go as the big brands for you know mass media uh, campaigns. So you start also looking at Yoni's uh, matrix, uh, you start to uh, validate your business model and you do that by addressing your customers efficiently. Um, so this is like uh, the first step uh, uh, where we need targeted ads. But more worrying is that when we move into scale-ups, it's a known fact that when you reach a critical mass, that is like absolutely key for any company where you get the unit, co unit cost down, um, uh, uh, where investors say, hey, here is where we uh, uh, put our bets. 
um, this is no longer going to be a European company because how are we to reach critical mass for our businesses if we can't attract our customers? This is going to be an Asian company. This is going to be a, a, a US company. And here to mention all the SMEs uh, that finally uh, got online, finally starting to uh, uh, sell, whether it's the flower shop on uh, around the corner or the uh, uh, larger SME um, selling business to business uh, components uh, to uh, the whole world. Uh, this will be a, a sincere drawback for uh, entrepreneurship um, uh, 20 years ago. So uh, I'm really happy, uh, Hina, that you uh, uh, that you share uh, this view. Um, an area, and I'm trying not to repeat because I agree with very much that have been say, uh, said uh, today, um, talking about Europe as a stepping stone to the world and to build uh, unicorns. We need to observe strictly the country of origin uh, principle, which is also being challenged uh, here. And from my understanding, to cope with 20 something legislations when you are just scaling within the so called digital single uh, market will be absolutely impossible for any uh, uh, scaler. Uh, to imagine and uh, uh, affording the legal bills uh, for this um, and to reflect that in your uh, in your business and adjust accordingly I think this is uh, 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 impossible so um, with these uh, words we recently uh, uh, wrote a letter to uh, primarily uh, Schaldemose with the this, uh, the startup nations uh, in uh, in Europe um, I would uh, uh, I would share a link to the letter uh, so I don't go into details but you will see a lot of ground uh, covered um, so that's the word uh, words from my side um, I hope we have time for a little bit of discussion as well. Thank you very much. I think you gave us a very practical point of view. And this letter we shared uh, has been connected with our members. So you get from them also some from them support. So I think it's very good that SMEs and entrepreneurs are organizing them and really can become active on the Brussels level because this is very important. Otherwise, you have you have no you are not visible. And I think this is very good that you do this effort. And it's not easy as startups and entrepreneurs to take over this role here. So Glenn, now you did this, it's your part. Uh, founder and exactly. secretary general of uh, platform. Oh, no, it's, it's platform. Not for a target. target. Absolutely. Go, Sweden. Go on, boss. Can you Sweden. manage it? <laughs> No, thank you very much indeed. So we're the largest platform economy uh, trade association in Northern Europe. So we bring in transportation, food delivery, all the way through to uh, the building sector, um, insurance and finance, through to uh, beauty, modeling, and also the uh, influencer marketing crowd. So the, the full range of, uh, uh, of professions that can be covered by the platform economy. And the, the great thing about going last is that you can just uh, uh, listen to the great inputs of everyone else and basically nod your head and say yes. And I think there's, there's great things that were brought up in the discussions uh, here. And I think that uh, we can uh, back those up. And what we're really seeing to, uh, uh, from, from a practical perspective is this need to, of course, address the legal goods, legal content, disinformation, hate speech, and have uh, 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 provisions in place to address that. But at the same time, not to be uh, limiting innovation, growth, and competitiveness. And I think one of the things that we see here is the, the intended uh, idea to hit large, mainly American platforms. Uh, the, the, the unintended consequences can be that the small, uh, the SMEs, the startups, and the scale-ups are actually negatively affected by this. So to really sort of back up what's said here, no to uh, restrictions on uh, uh, targeting, targeted advertising. At the same time, the, uh, uh, the recommender systems, no ban on that. Um, and at the same time, we're looking at tra transparency for algorithms as well. Of course, have uh, openness. But when there is a, a, a limit on sort of competitive circumstances or, of course, customer confidentiality, then, of course, we can't go too far. But to do this in the right way and in a smart way, uh, so to really be able to back up these elements here so we can move forward and not overburden um, SMEs 
uh, and prevent this innovation and growth, which is so important now, but also going into the future as well. And Henna, I really appreciate the approach that you're taking and fighting the good fights on the uh, on the inside on this uh, uh, very, very important uh, topic, but also interlinked to everything that's the EU Data Act, uh, AI, um, DMA, all these sort of uh, surrounding issues which are coming up at the same time that we need to get all the pieces right within this uh, uh, discussion and within this process. Thank you very much. And uh, because of one hour, we start a bit later. I want to give the opportunity now to Hannah to react. Perhaps you have some comments or questions, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Horst, and <clears throat> thank you, everybody, Frederick, Sebastian, Annelise, Joni, Peter, and Glenn, for, for your, I think, really good uh, comments and remarks, and also concrete examples from the, from the different articles here. Uh, it's, it's, I think it all shows how difficult it is to regulate, like, digital markets in the same time when I think it's very good principle that yes, everything what is illegal offline should be illegal online, but we know that in online world, we can have that kind of actions then uh, they, they don't exist in our offline world. And that is of course uh, the difficulty here. And then also uh, like it was mentioned already many times in your comments, our, our legislation should be also future proof because we know that the technology is developing very fast and there's coming new services and ideas all the time to the markets and we shouldn't set barriers for them so which we, we should have a very long time perspective here and we should be very technology neutral in the same time when we are uh, setting the principles here and uh, i think also when we say that uh, we should uh, focus to illegal content and products and um, services we have to write, uh, find the right balance there that we should avoid over removals. And uh, anyway, we should have a clear, clear line there, but not too detailed uh, obligations because of course it means always regulatory burden. And in the same time, when I think more transparency is needed for the many services, like it was said already, have to also remember that this is business for, for the companies who are there in the internet. And we have to look at where is there like business secrets that we can't open too, too many things there. And in the same time, we should all the time uh, encourage, I think, innovations and growth in this field. And I, I feel that this is very challenging because like, like it was said already many times that now the politicians, they are very much focusing in discussions to just uh, for the biggest players to some very large online platforms. They are just thinking about them and especially maybe just like Facebook or some other um, uh, social media platforms, but because this uh, regulation, it will have impacts to whole ecosystem and for all the businesses. That's why it's so important to stress and underline the role of SMEs and startups on this scan. And I'm very happy also now when we are in the negotiations with uh, Imco Shadows and we are trying to um, find compromises of the different articles. Like, you know, that there was uh, like hundreds of different amendments tabled. Um, I think there is understanding for SMEs and for startups. So I'm, I'm quite positive um, that we can find a good outcome because I, I have an understanding that many political groups, they understand anyway, the needs of micro and small enterprises and uh, that we shouldn't set uh, too much uh, regulatory burden for the smallest ones. And we have to encourage the innovations, but of course we have I think uh, still many, many meetings ahead of us, but uh, right now I'm anyway quite positive because I have the feeling that there is, there's a lot of understanding for the smallest uh, players and for startups and uh, SMEs uh, in the political groups. But thank you for you, for your, I think you had very, very good comments about uh, different uh, parts of the regulation and you can be sure that we have been discussing about all these all these parts many times already, but we haven't final, finalized anything yet. So, and we have also decided that uh, nothing is like, uh, nothing is uh, decided until everything is decided. And uh, so it seems that we have several weeks ahead of us. Uh, 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 in the beginning, the idea was that IMCO committee should vote on 8th of uh, November, so in one week, but now it's postponed, so it will happen maybe somewhere in December or so on, because we need more time to negotiate. 
but thank you for all of you. I think it was very, also very encouraging for me because these are exactly, I think, the parts I have been fighting for. So it was very good to hear that you, you, you know, you share the same views. Thank you very much, Hannah. Also that you said it will be the vote perhaps in December. This is really more time. Uh, and, and, and I have to say we need also more time. And we want also to support with, with our SME ecosystem, the, 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 you and your work. And I think this is, if you are open for us, then it's also clear that we want to support your work. And I think we have an excellent network and excellent speakers here. I think there are a lot of ideas and it's of course, Consumer rights are very important. Democratic standards in the in the internet is very important, but also jobs and growth. And, and, and this is very important. I think you should not separate the discussion and it's more complex than sometimes it's it's discussed. And I think at least, if you always speak about big tech, at least SME should have the same relevance, equal relevance in the discussion, also in the public discussion. If there are no questions left, because really we wanted only to have one hour because DSA is very much discussed, but we wanted to give really the chance to SMEs and startups to give here really a practical and I think also emotional message to politics. It's about the, their future. And I think if you give a half lot to your business, you want not you want to have also a future and i think a regulation should always keep in mind entrepreneurship is also spirit and you should not break it with too much bureaucracy thank you very much <laughs>